From demand to supply and everything in between, there is a huge amount of uncertainty within supply chains. Traditionally, this is managed using buffer stock. However, often there are events which can occur, which can upset even the most conservative of plans. Today on Locad TV, we're delighted to be joined by Stefan de Kock, the founder of Wahoopa, who's going to explain to us why this uncertainty should not actually be seen as a hindrance, but something that should be embraced. So Stefan, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, perhaps you could start off by just telling us a little bit about your background and also Wahoopa, the company you founded. Well, uh, thank you, Kieran and uh, Johannes, for having me. Um, yeah, so um, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of uh, Wahoopa. I, uh, I started um, studying applied mathematics um, in the Technical University of Delft in, in the Netherlands and um, never heard of this thing called supply chain. Um, after I hit the job market by accident, I, um, I encountered a supply chain software company and, um, and joined them and never um, regretted it for a, uh, for a single uh, moment. Um, and then uh, I did a lot of work for them and um, a lot of customers uh, in consulting, software consulting, functional consulting, uh, software product management. And then uh, you know, another chance encounter, um, I found myself out of a job and uh, that's the, the moment when I realized that uh, you know all these ideas I'd been working on, all the issues I'd discovered over the years, um, I could actually do something about them now, uh, things that I wasn't able to do uh, before. Um, and the, the, the original idea was to build a platform that was something bigger than SNLP at the time, and um, you know that included a lot of the, the best of breed solutions, but not a lot of the problems they had. Uh, mostly integration, which I I found was about seventy percent of every implementation was taken up by integration. Um, and I wanted to make a, a platform that was available to the smaller uh, companies out there, um, even the the products then were uh, mainly targeted at uh, the, the big tier one companies and the smaller companies that had the same problems didn't really have a good solution. So that, that was how it started. Um, and then I found, and this was way back in 2003, um, that I found that finding the people that could actually build it uh, was uh, incredibly hard. So over the years, um, I, um, I morphed the idea, it grew, I had more epiphanies, and um, ultimately, a couple of years ago, I found the guys that I finally was convinced that uh, they could build this thing, and uh, they were convinced that this was a great idea to get involved with, and we started, uh, we started with Hoopa. Okay, and that brings us nice and neatly onto our topic today, which is embracing uncertainty within supply chains. Um, so demand is obviously the obvious example, but what other classes of uncertainty can we encounter? What kinds of uncertainty? Well, you know, everything in the future potentially is uncertain. So if you're in a supply chain, uh, you th have to think about not just the quantities, uh, but maybe also the lead times, durations, um, quality or grade, um, yields, rates, um, pretty much anything um, that is going to happen in the future is uncertain to various degrees. Um, so um, we really have to look at uh, the impact, not just of the, the average value of, of all these future things, um, we have to look at all the possible combinations or uh, of all the possible futures, um, which sounds very uh, uh, complex, and it is, but it's also what we need to do. And, um, and once something moves into the past, it's almost certain, right? Even in the past, there's some uncertainty. You've got data issues that you might not even know if something truly happened a certain way. But for the most part, once it's, it's reached the past, it's, uh, it's no longer um, uncertain uh, to a large degree, and somewhere in the middle, that uncertainty reduces slowly over time. Okay, and uh, Johannes is going to be joining us as part of our discussion today. Um, Johannes, this idea of um, encountering an uncertain future, it's very much kind of the core of a low-cut approach. Um, so how do you approach these challenges? I mean, the, the historical approach was 
the what if scenarios, you know, uh, and it's, it's, you know, you make a, an optimistic scenario, pessimistic scenario, and the main issues that you have when you, when you want to deal with, you know, okay, future is uncertain, let's have a few scenarios, is that um, very quickly it becomes incredibly tedious and time consuming. You know, it, it just, it takes so much effort to spell out those scenarios, spell out stuff. The interesting thing about this, this probabilistic forecasting perspective, it's, it's, it's in a way you're kind of brute forcing the problem. You, know? you would think, oh, let's think about all the possible future. It sounds like insane or, or insanely difficult, but it turned out that if you have enough processing power, enough your raw processing power, it's actually a lot easier to, to impl first implement the software and then just run the damn thing compared to have like a super complex system to manage your many scenarios. It's very interesting because we are arriving at a time where not only it's uh, mathematically, it's a very elegant and concise way to deal with very complex phenomenon, but also people-wise, because obviously supply chain are lean, you don't have that many people. It's interesting because I see that it's relatively lean both from the software editor viewpoint and from the operational viewpoint, the people that will have to put on top of the system to actually operate a supply chain. So that's, that gets me very, very interested and excited about this, this approach. Okay, uh, Stefan, let's kind of look at maybe some of the more traditional approaches people take. Um, how are you seeing those sort of classical approaches that people are taking in order to account for that level of uncertainty? Um, well, so there, there's really two, three different ways that, uh, that people deal um, with, with uncertainty. And uh, the number one, of course, being uh, buffers. Um, the, the second one, they can uh, respond to the uncertainty as it happens, build a, a respond um, mechanism, um, such as uh, expediting or, or what have you. And then the third one is they just ignore it, right? And um, those three, everyone is doing some of it, some of each of them, and everyone should. The question is, how much should you spend in each? And uh, what what generally happens is that with the buffers, it's all about the accuracy of the buffer. And if you get your your buffer wrong, you need to overcompensate by responding, uh, which is typically the uh, the expensive part. And then finally, the parts that you cannot respond to, those are the parts that you know you have to ignore. And those are the ones that do the most damage on, on the long term of a company. You know, customers get annoyed. Uh, you might lose market share. It might even lead to, you know, lawsuits or ultimately bankruptcy in, in some cases where, you know, if, the, if you ignore the customer long enough, uh, it goes, uh, goes really south. Um, and if we think about buffers, you know, what are buffers? The, the most common ones, of course, are lead times. And, uh, and capacities and inventories. Um, and, and, and companies will fatten them up um, because they know that if they're short, um, they're going to um, basically run into issues that uh, lead to uh, response. Um, and, and just to give you an indication, um, from what I've seen, a lot of com companies I've been to, they're targeting 95 to 99% uh, service levels, and then when you measure what their service really is, they're achieving at best 90%. They're, they're usually, you know, those companies that targeting those levels are at the upper 80s. But when you dig deeper, you find that even that number is usually driven by the response, not by the buffer that they had initially planned. So they're expediting cost and effort and the amount of mayhem that all the instability the firefighting brings is off the charts and, and this, the inventory might only be providing them 73% service even though they were targeted to be 98. Um, and, and of course that, it, that just drains the, the capabilities of the company, it erodes the margins. Um, and it, it, that, that I think is the status quo of most supply chains today is a, a, a severe moving of all the burden onto the response part.
Okay, uh, let's look a bit at that probabilistic approach then. Um, Johannes, it was something that took a few years for you to come about. Um, so where did this idea kind of come from? I mean, we, we came across, I mean, probabilistic forecast for us was a journey. We actually started with classic forecasts, you know, where you just forecast the mean. And then we realized on for actually people that were, we had a, 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 a client selling car parts and, um, and we realized that if we were doing just classic forecasts, we'd just forecast zero pretty much everywhere. And that would be it, you know, that, that it was so sparse, so intermittent that basically forecasting zero just everywhere was actually accuracy wise very, very good. Um, and it was obviously complete nonsense. And we came up first to quantile forecast, which was, oh, no, you, you don't want to forecast the average demand. You want to forecast something that has a bias on purpose. And a, a bias, a forecast with that, uh, of, that has like a, an intentional bias, it's called a quantile forecast. And that was the first step to say, okay, what should be just as, as Stefan described, you know, these situations where those C items, you know, A, B, C, those C items that are slow movers, how do you know if you want to have like one unit, two units in stock, maybe three, um, and not just have like a min max? So w first we realized that quantile forecast was a first step to even start to get results that were m meaningful, you know, start, exit the, the, the situation where just forecasting zero is the best, you know, it was making no sense whatsoever. And then we realized, oh, you have one, a, a forecast with a quantile, but what about, you know, tuning this quantile, because you can tune how much bias do you want. And then we, we went from quantile to quantile grids. Let's have like a series of biases, you know, incrementally increasing. And then we realized, no, but, we should probably have like all the biases different. And then we were basically down to, so we went to quantile, quantile grid, then probabilistic forecast. And then we, and, and by the way, there are separate literatures, st statistical literature. And, and it seems that many other people in the statistical community went, uh, took the same journey from us, which is basically start with unbiased, in, uh, you know, forecast or prediction move to bias once and then explore many biases and then try to do everything at once and that's and, and probabilistic forecast here you go okay and stefan you're also probably one of the few people in the industry outside of locad who is also embracing this idea of a probabilistic forecast um so kind of what led to you to having these ideas um well i, I guess this is where i talk about uh some of my epiphanies um the first one which was that the uncertain values cannot re be represented by exact numbers. Um, probably as early as 2006, um, I, I, I got that, and uh, but I hadn't figured it out. It wasn't a true epiphany yet at the, at the time. Um, I hadn't figured out how to make it work. It just didn't make sense to do it that way. And I'm finally, I, I, I've been working on developing what I call a probabilistic arithmetic and when I figured out how to make it work, and I looked back and I saw how something that looked so complex was actually solvable by something so elegant, um, it all fell into place. And that's, that's where I had my first uh, aha moment. And, um, but at the time I was, I was keeping it uh, a secret. I thought this is you know, one of my key differentiators. So I certainly wasn't pushing it yet. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't until later, and this is another one of those serendipitous moments in my uh, career where I found myself needing money and looking for a job. And I found another company that uh, was right in my hometown of Boston, that was one of the three companies in the world that, uh, that do this among uh, like Locat and, and Wahoopa, at, at least at the time. And um, they, I found they'd been doing this since the 1970s. And... Um, they have been proving this, but they same have been keeping this a secret because this was their uh, secret sauce. And um, I, f I figured out a couple of things. And, and I think the key ones there were that there are many ways that you can achieve the same thing. Uh, you know, their approach was very different than mine and very different from yours as well. Um, but the, the ultimate objective is the same thing. So. It wasn't that the way to do it was the, uh, the thing that we need to push. It was the concept of that it needed to be done. 
And uh, so I also figured out at that point that I could talk about it, I could blog about it, I could write articles about it without actually you know, giving away the secret recipe um, of what made us special or what makes you special, but still you know, making people aware that this is ultimately what all planning and all forecasting will need to become in, you know, in the next decade or so. And number four, and that's something more recently, I've been pushing that one uh, more of late, is that the traditional metrics are wrong as well. Right? It, what most people don't know is when you change a metric and you decide what's the best forecast, if you have to decide between a number, that choice, the answer is going to, to change. The metric is, is very important, not just uh, to make a percentage point different, but choosing between one or another. And we need to change the metrics and we need not just uh, probabilistic forecasts and plans, we need probabilistic metrics to measure the value of that. And those are really the, the, the key ones and that's what I've been you know, very eagerly pushing in, in recent years. And that's something I think, Janice, you definitely agree in and that we probably need to change these metrics and that's why we're pushing that kind of, instead of dollars, uh, percentages of error, we're producing that idea of an economic basis and using actual dollars of error. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and it's the, the sort of things that are very interesting is that indeed, um, uh, once you have something po something poetic, basically you can somehow simulate many many possible futures. And if you can simulate many possible futures, you can challenge every single decision you look at with its outcome, as if you knew the future. You know, it's 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 a what if you say, okay, I knew the future is going to do that. I compute the end game result of a decision because I know the future and then I just average out my outcomes according to probability. So it gives you like a very elegant way to kind of rank all your decisions, to prioritize all your decisions and sort of things. But, um, and, and indeed, I completely agree with Stefan, you know, the, the secret sauce is, is kind of unimportant, although, I mean, my own perspective on that is uh, uh, I would love to believe that the, the 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 numerical recipe or you know the technology is super important but literally the the story of locad is that we i have already you know discarded five generation of forecasting engines since i created locad so we 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 write it down at every single time we're thinking it was like the greatest thing of all time just to um, two years later, realized that there was a way to do it so much better and just discard the code and delete the code and, 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 and replace it with the next generation. And uh, so we, we went from those, you know, uh, quantile, quantile grid, probabilistic, and then we have done deep learning and now we are differentiable programming and we already see what will be the next stage. So basically we, we kept rewriting the same thing. And um, But the interesting thing is that as, as we were moving forward with these ideas, is that the fact that um, there is viability in the future can also be exploited. You know, it, it, it's something that is very interesting that it's not something where you only like, um, you only have to kind of protect yourself and, 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 and try to be more resilient, that's one angle, but you can also take advantage of the fact that there is um, uh, viability in the first place. Uh, Stefan, if we uh, start to look at things maybe now from a customer's perspective, um, how can we help them embrace this idea of um, accepting that uncertainty and what are kind of the strategies they can employ from kind of a software perspective? Um, the key part is if you've got a complex engine um, and you get a black box output, um, it doesn't lead to a lot of trust. So the output should be self-explanatory, right? So, and that's, I think, uh, where with probabilities, you can do an incredible amount. You can say, look, we don't just think the answer is going to be 100. We think the answer is going to be anywhere between a, a number of values. And there's this, this distribution of how these values may occur. And you can look at that at, a, at any kind of level. And it's all about the visualization, really, of those results. And, and I, I like to think of it almost like a, a car. Um, you know, we are the mechanics and the customer is the, the driver. And in the old days, I knew how, I understood how my car worked. And now it's, it's beautiful. I look in there, it's beautiful, but I have no idea what makes it tick. And even the mechanic has to plug in a, a, a cable to log, uh, connect it to its computer to figure out what's going on. In the, and that's how I think the solutions of the future 
and what, what we're all bringing uh, are all about is bringing that sophistication but making it easier for the user uh, for the driver um, to actually use it and to get an output that they can use and that they can make decisions upon that are safer okay great and uh, Johannes um, if we stick with kind of that customer perspective um, what does it mean for kind of a company to change to that probabilistic approach when you start to think about probabilities people it's it's, it's about you know just try to think about the sort of big forces that you're trying to balance, you know, what are the sort of problems that you're trying to mitigate? What are the, 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 the bottleneck that are going to hit you the most and hurt you, you know, um, that, that are going to, to hurt the most? And usually it's very funny because those, those probabilistic forecasting just give you a way to quantify. Uh, it's like the recipe that finally let you quantify what was kind of frequently just obvious in terms of intuition. So it's, it's not like AI may, uh, producing like fantastical insight. I mean, my own experience is that uh, it's kind of the opposite. It, it just puts stuff that were fairly obvious in the, in the first place, but for the first time, the system just give you, um, you know, numbers that kind of match with the intuition in very mundane ways, such as you have a product that is highly perishable, um, you know, don't put too much stock on it. You know, uh, it's, you're just taking massive risk with a super perishable product to have high stocks. And if you just take like a classic forecasting, it's just going to say, oh, to um, just reach 97% service level and be done with it. And then you just create massive overstock that with products as they expire. Um, you take the probabilistic approach, the forecast might even be worse actually. It might even not even be like super good, but it just more balance the fact that you have this risk that ha whenever you hit the, the stock out, you know, the expiration date, uh, you have something that is very costly and thus it steers the decision towards something that is much more sensical, which is don't overstock strawberries, you know. And it's, so, it, so I completely agree with the idea that, um, uh, that Stefan de said that commercial editors have to kind of convey simplicity, although, uh, to be fair, I don't think that LowCAD we had like the most brilliant track record of delivering the simplest stuff ever. But well, we're, we're at least we're trying. Okay, uh, Stefan, we'll leave the uh, the last word to you. Um, from what you've observed in the marketplace, would you say that people are ready to embrace that idea of uh, accepting uncertainty? And what is it that really excites you for the future? Um, I think we're getting there. Um, you know, I've witnessed over the years a lot of pushback. Um, it's been kind of an uphill battle, but I think we're reaching the top. It's, it's becoming flatter. I'm getting um, less pushback. I'm noticing less pushback. Um, so I, I think the market is realizing. Um, I, I think there's the two-step approach. The first step that uh, an exact number is not the, the right way to go about dealing with uncertainty. Step two, um, that's where I see still a little bit of the friction, is um, they think it's overly complex. They, they, everyone who says, yeah, you could do it, but, and there's always that but, um, and the but is often big data. Um, you need lots of data to do it probabilistically. Well, that's just not true, right? You just need historical data, which you have in every ERP system. Um, to solve the same problem that you would do deterministically. Um, and the other one that a lot of people can't get over is how do you um, deal with multiple possible futures, right? That's going to explode the number of possibilities. Um, you know, one probabilistic forecast will lead to a bazillion uh, probable plans that you could base off of it. And really, one probabilistic forecast could lead to one probabilistic plan. Uh, it's just the same, you know, exp express it in distribution. So that is, that is the part I think that people are at this point still struggling with. Um, but I'm, I'm excited. I'm seeing the trend. I'm seeing um, where it's going. Uh, I'm seeing a lot more acceptance from uh, some people that were vehement against uh, this whole approach. Earlier on, I see more and more that are making the switch that, that that also had the epiphany. And so 
it's it's a matter of getting to that critical mass and and it will be embraced by the mainstream i'm sure uh, excited about that okay brilliant well we're gonna have to leave it there but thank you both for your time thanks very much for tuning in and we'll see you again in the next episode bye for now